taking like the value system hierarchy of mods was uh, traditionally the total conversion. And I think virtually every game engine had a Star Wars total conversion project <laughs> to try to put together to reskin all the mechanics of Star Wars, replace all the assets of Star Wars, you know, have those blaster sounds instead of like an AK-47 sound and so on. Um, almost all of them, I think, failed and collapsed under the, the weight of their own endeavors. Um, this particular one is from Call of Duty 4. Um, but for the, all the mods that were kind of about exploiting um, intellectual property without like, licensing it or whatever, um, there are a bunch of mods that were kind of like paving new territory. Um, this is a total conversion mod called The Ship for the Half-Life 1 engine. And in the ship, it's kind of like a game of, a virtual game of like assassins set on a cruise ship. And you're walking around and you have like a quarry to like trail, and you follow them like maybe like into the bathrooms or something. And while they're taking a whiz, you like hit them with an umbrella and they die. And then once you kill them, you get their target. And so on, or if someone kills you, they get your target. And what I really liked about this mod, actually, was that there were a bunch of bots roaming the cruise ship. So it was one really powerful strategy was to actually pretend you were a bot and like run and like walk in like weird 90 degree angles and suddenly stop in the middle of the hallway and stare off into space and don't do anything and don't give yourself away as a human. So in a way, it kind of it was kind of doing this reverse Turing test mechanic that's been popularized by um, Spy Party, but it was kind of doing this in like 2004, which is kind of interesting that it kind of didn't really take off either. Maybe just wrong place, wrong time, and so on. Um, there's also another different type of mod called the Graphics Upgrade. Um, this one is from a mod called Fake Factory for um, the Source Engine, and it just kind of... I don't think they're upgrade graphics upgrades, I think they kind of make the game substantially worse. And like, this is this replacing the character models in Half-Life 2, Episode 2, and it's just kind of... They look scary, and they have a like, duck face, and it's just really creepy. Um, not to put down their efforts, although I guess I am. <laughs> um, and then there are also these mods that are kind of these map packs. Um, this was a pop, really, really popular map pack called Minerva Metastasis that had a Latin-speaking AI kind of guiding on this island. It was for a uh, Half-Life 2 engine. And it was made by this um, really talented designer named Adam Foster, and he's at Valve now. Um, and a lot of the reason was that Minerva Metastasis was a really it was just like a really polished, like, condensed version of like Half-Life 2 combat. And the way he distilled that was really elegant. And I also kind of <laughs> make this different kind of statement about maps and map packs. Um, traditionally, they weren't really considered mods, you know. You know, right now we're really caught up in like the, oh, what's a game, what games are kind of debate. Well, the mod community kind of had its own mini, like, what are mods to be? And I, I guess the general consensus was that the mod had to have, like, custom code and custom binaries, and you had to be changing the actual, like, code. But I don't think that's necessarily what defines a mod. Um, this screenshot is from a surf map for Counter-Strike Source. And it doesn't really change any game code, but it kind of exploits this weird physics, player physics, player movement bug in Counter-Strike Source that enables you to like accelerate like infinitely and like go off this slope and like do random, do crazy like aerobatic stunts and stuff. And that's not Counter-Strike, right? That's a totally different game mode. Except, you know, if we're to agree with Naomi about the fact that player that games require players. So to a certain extent that play, that games exist in part because players agree that they exist, right? 
So if players agree that a game is something completely different, now that game is something completely different. Now instead of shooting each other, you're sliding at infinite speed off these random slopes in these crazy like abstract worlds. So that's kind of my argument for maps or mods, because they reconfigure our way of perceiving the game system. Um, this is another kind of cool find in the Team Fortress 2 community. Um, it used to be that you, had to grunt, that you had to, I guess, grind for achievements to unlock we new weapons to use in the multiplayer shooter Team Fortress 2. Um, so this kind of new genre of like achievement maps sprung up where people would just shoot like rockets into like walls to get their rockets fired count all the way up so they could unlock some new weapon or something. And the Team Fortress 2 designers were probably like freaking out that people were kind of exploiting their system like this. Um, but then kind of someone started making these levels where it was an achievement map where you know people are shooting rockets and grinding for achievements. Except after like a few minutes, like a giant cat would rise out of the ground and like ominous music would play, and, like the sky would darken, and the cat would start shooting like eyes, like laser eyes at each, like all the players and killing everyone and slaughtering everyone to like punish them for their like incompetence or something. <laughs> and that kind of became a genre in itself. Like achievement first became first this achievement map genre emerged. And then this achievement joke map, kind of, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. Uh, this isn't the only achievement joke map. There's another one like a giant robot comes out too and like slaughters everyone. Would you say the type of trolling? Yes, yeah, it's a type of trolling, except it's like awesome. Like I think players really, <laughs> players really like being trolled. Like they're like, oh, this is so much better than achievement map. And it's also kind of a commentary on achievement maps too, right? Like. Why are you doing this achievement map when awesome stuff can happen if you actually play these other maps? And there are also a lot of trends and like waves that kind of emerge in the mod community. Like mods that are kind of about basically about the same thing with kind of basically the same kind of sort of abstraction in the way they think about their content. Um, these were three Hong Kong Blood Opera themed mods that came out for Half-Life 1. Um, Action Half-Life, The Specialists, and The Opera. And they were all kind of, um, I don't know, at the risk of like negging them again. Um, <laughs> they're all kind of the same, actually. Um, which is kind of weird. We don't think of mods as having like market share, right? Because you're not paying anything for them. Like a player could play all three mods, they didn't like choose one and say, oh well, that's it. But then they kind of did. It was kind of weird, like the player community is kind of like fiercely defended. They're like, no, sharks, no, jets. And they're like, like. <laughs> um, another trend wave was these like military team-based multiplayer teamwork mods. Um, top one's frontline force, one on the left is hostile intent, and one on the right is firearms. And they're kind of about like, ooh, authentic, realistic, but arcade action where you can like sprint and shoot a giant machine gun with no consequences. And kind of all these mods emerged in the Half-Life 1 community kind of all at the same time. Um, and then this kind of idea that like all these, these like clusters of waves of mods kind of kept going into Half-Life 2. Uh, these were three zombie mods that came out for Half-Life 2. Um, I think the top one's No More Room in Hell, and on the left is called Zombie Master. And that one was actually kind of cool, because one player got to control the zombies to try to kill everyone. And one on the right is um, Zombie Cannon Source. Um, I'm also kind of guilty of falling into this kind of trend and wave category. Um, art games were kind of getting popular during the lifetime of Half-Life 2's mod community. And it kind of seemed natural to kind of bring the Jason Moore kind of art game discourse into the mod space. Um, always those are kind of my intentions. I can't speak for anyone else, I guess. Um, the one on the left is the original version of Dear Esther, which was released in 2008 as a research project by Dan Pinchbeck. And, um, and now when you explore an island as someone tells you a randomized, procedurally generated like ghost story, and you should totally play Dear Esther. 
And one at the top is another like art mod, so to speak. There was kind of this big backlash against us, so-called art mods. Um, except the Stanley Parable kind of emerged as this universally loved mod, um, downloaded like a jillion times. And um, this one was kind of a mod about like free will and branching narrative and how are those like really reconcilable. And then there's also my mod called Radiator. I guess I was kind of contemporary with these mods, um, except no one really played my mod. That's what I did. Um, oh, thank you. Um, yeah, it's just a mod about feelings and stuff. You can solve them by yourself. Um, but this kind of idea of um, mods kind of emerging as like clusters of similar mods was also took place across engines. Um, you have the, this like tactical SWAT anti-terrorist thing that went that was really popular. Um, of course, we kind of all know Counter Strike is that by one, but there's also Infiltration for Unreal Tournament on the left and Urban Terror for the Quake Three engine on the right. And it's kind of interesting in that they were kind of it was like, no, the weapons in Infiltration are better than the ones in Counter Strike, and you kind of have people like passionately defending their territory and trying to like pee on each other, I guess. To mark their territory. <laughs> <laughs> so the kind of sum I guess if you want to go by this like clinical definition to remain, I guess, inclusive as inclusive as possible. Mods were just these new rules or new content for the game of both. They were free, you could not sell them. Uh, because they were built on top of existing commercially developed technology. And they required a retail copy, which is why a lot of um, professional game developers really love it, because you extend the lifetime of their game for free, and they don't really have to do anything. And I think um, the zombie mod DayZ has actually sold like 200,000 more copies of Arma 2, which is great. But I'm not, I feel like that doesn't really describe what mods really like are. I'm kind of interested in what mods kind of meant um, to us. And to the us modders, um, mods meant a way to like break into the industry, you know, to prove your worth, prove you got like spunk and gumption and all that, and, and graduate, I guess, to the um, professional game developer um, industry, and they would hopefully like take you on and you're like the scrappy young buck and so on. Um, but mods also kind of meant, I guess as an aesthetic mod, they also meant it was like a commentary. Like every mod you release, because it's based on a previous game, by virtue, I, I would argue that it's inherently a commentary on this previous game. Like, oh, doesn't armor like in Doom kind of function like luck? Oh, shouldn't the guns in Half-Life function this way? It's kind of a design commentary, so to speak, or maybe a cultural commentary. Like maybe Dear Esther is saying, do we really need guns in Half-Life 2? Like, can we just appreciate the sense of the world? And there's also like kind of cool, this cool like built-in audience built into these mods too. And all this kind of died, um, kind of, because well, if we're if we remember a kind of the beginning of that mod section, I was kind of arguing that the modiest mods, like the top of the mod food chain, were the total conversions. But these days, there's really no reason to do a total conversion because of the wide availability of, the wide availability of middleware, like Unity and UDK and the new uh, CryEngine um, SDK. And those are all like free to use, and some of them have really permissive licensing where you can even sell your game and you wouldn't even know both of them. Um, so that kind of money kind of enters the equation too at that point. Um, at the film screen last night, Jim Monroe was kind of arguing that, you know, it's not really about selling these games. You know, like selling your art doesn't equate to legitimacy. Um, which I really want to agree with, but at the same time I'm also like, no, like mods are valuable. You should give us your money. So, <laughs> um, so that's kind of why this kind of what really pervasive, powerful attitude about mods kind of has died down these days. That isn't to say that no one's modding. When I say modding is dead, 
I'm trying to state that our old sense of what mods were is dead. Mods are still very much alive. They're just really different from what they were in the Half-Life 1 or Half-Life 2 eras. Um, this is a mod called Gary's Mod, um, which doesn't fit the typical mod template at all. It ships with two or three like barely decorated maps. Um, it doesn't really have any content in itself. You upload content from your other source games, so you can like make weird screenshots of like the G-Man from Half-Life 2 with like crazy scary smiles and so on. And it's actually kind of defied really our conception of mods because people make mods for Gary's mod, actually. It's it's kind of nurtured its own kind of ecosystem. And it's and the graph on the bottom is a sales graph that uh, Gary Newman, the period of Gary's mod, recently tweeted. Um, and it looks like it's been selling like a thousand copies like every day. That's like pretty good. Um, so again, I kind of want to argue that like mods have this kind of value and maybe we should pay for them. And that's why mods are different. Oh, and that giant jump at the end is the Steam Summer Sale. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but mods are also really different um, in another way. This is the <laughs> Steam Workshop for Skyrim, the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. And Steam Workshop is kind of this really cool like, centralized iTunes for mods where you can kind of subscribe to mods and they'll automatically update, and they'll automatically install and everything, and it's like magic, and it's great. Um, and you can like browse these game pages. Um, and I also want to kind of focus your attention on um, this mod at the top called Less Condescending Guards. <laughs> um, in Skyrim, um, NPCs have access to like your character stats, so they look at your character stats and then kind of say like a context, like specific bark at you, um, depending on your character stats. So maybe if you have like 50 out of 100 like in fire magic or something in this video game, the NPCs will say like, oh, don't burn the house down, ha ha ha, <laughs> or, or some kind of cheesy joke like that. And um, count me among the many, I don't know, like the 20,000 people who downloaded this mod who didn't really care for that and kind of felt condescended to. And that's kind of my point as, this is a design commentary, this is a criticism of Skyrim, but it's not in the form of some angry like blog post, this is like a change to the system. This is like a criticism about games in the form of a game, which I found is, is a really powerful feature of mods. Um, there are also various other mods, like a Minecraft mod, of course. Um, auto unequip arrows, that's like an interface mod. That's like an interface critique of Skyrim. Um, there's another one that just adds more ambient sounds to a city, which I find really beautiful. And there's better werewolf, which makes the werewolf character better in Skyrim. It's kind of stuck more. <laughs> um, and these are great because none of these mods would have existed in the Half-Life 1 era, right? These all do very small incremental changes that plug into a larger system. These are kind of like very unique. These aren't these aren't giant total conversions, right? These are kind of total opposite. And that's kind of what I think mods are. Um, this is a graph I charted of um, the total post count of mod communities um, per month from February 2001 to July 2012. Um, and I kind of went to archive.org and tried to pull all these post counts to try to get a set, like, ballpark sense of what, like, activity was at these various mod sites. And, I mean, this is a totally flawed methodology. This isn't as rigorous as, like, how it's in or something. Um, total post count doesn't indicate creative output and so on, but I just wanted this ballpark sense. So you kind of, you can see all these different kind of lines converging, and uh, when it kind of flatlines, that kind of means that mod community, not much is really happening, that the mod community has kind of died. And you can see a lot of communities actually kind of flatlining, which is kind of sad. Um, but just for fun, I kind of put TIG source up there, the independent gaming source website, which is kind of the indie scene hub. And you can see it's kind of emerged kind of late in the game. It starts at like the 60 month mark, and it kind of shoots up. 
and it's kind of been maintaining its kind of like velocity, which is really good. Um, but does anyone want to guess what that red line is? It's not in the budget. Minecraft? Yeah. Oh, God. It's Minecraft. And that's the graph for the total post count in the Minecraft. And that's just the modding section. So it's actually like, it's like quadruple. Like my, the Minecraft mod community is bigger than like the corpses of every single mod community that came before it. It's kind of... Like, I knew Minecraft was big, but in this graph, like, still kind of defies my comprehension of what, how big it is. So Minecraft, big, have a Minecraft wedding, have, buy Minecraft merchandise, so on. It's, it's kind of this kind of zeitgeist thing of our generation, I guess. And again, kind of Minecraft kind of falls into this, um, that disruptive technology, disruptive innovation thing I was talking about earlier. Uh, Minecraft is actually kind of based on this core concept uh, which was by Zach Barth in 2009, called Infiniminer. Woo! Woo! Infiniminer. Um, but unfortunately, um, hackers like decompiled the binaries and assemblies for Infiniminer, and then they kind of forked and made their own versions of Infiniminer, or made these hacks that kind of stabilized the community. So the creator, uh, Zach Barth, he kind of felt really depressed and sad and kind of betrayed by all this, so he stopped working on Infiniminer. Um, not really like Infiniminer, so he kind of made his own like more fantasy themed version of Infiniminer. Infiniminer is more futuristic, and of course we kind of know how that story ended. Not, not just kind of an institution in itself, and Minecraft is an institution. Um, so that kind of speaks to, you know, Infiniminer was the Xerox iPad in this analogy, I guess. So that's kind of. Then, and then that modding story, you know, Minecraft is kind of this institution, mods are totally different from before. Um, now, I think I have like seven minutes left. Um, I'm going to talk about the eclectic indie scene. I'm going to talk about like 18 different indie games, so I'm going to like bombard and shock it off. The indie FPS. Um, a few months ago, there's this event called the 7 Day FPS. Um, game jams are very popular among the indie indies. Um, and this was kind of a seven day game jam to make a first person game. And kind of the rationale was that, oh, first person games are just, you know, Call of Duty, blah, 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 there's no innovation. We need to bring our indie spunk and really just refresh this totally stagnated genre. Um, which I kind of resent because my argument is that we've been in this genre the whole time. Like, you guys are kind of late to the party. We've been here for a long, long, long time. And to kind of say like, oh, now the cavalry's arrived. No, we didn't need saving. We were kind of here for a long time. So with that kind of bitterness out of the way, I kind of want to talk about <laughs> these um, really cool first person games that existed well before the seven day FPS to kind of reassure myself that I was important and relevant. <laughs> <laughs> This is a game called At a Distance. Um, it was made for NY Nyokor by Terry Kavanaugh. And this kind of, it's, it was kind of speaks to this like, sense of embodiment. Um, it's hard to talk about this game without spoiling it, and I feel really bad about spoiling it. So I'm just going to say Google At a Distance if you haven't played it and play it. Um, there's another game called Photo um, It's kind of a, um, where a cannonball is kind of the, First, it's kind of the two-dimensional runner, one-button runner. Phonica is like a first-person 3D runner, where you're just going down this tunnel at like blinding speeds, and you have to jump and time your jumps and so on. And this has a really fantastic sensation of speed, you know? He could have just put motion blur everywhere and kind of called it a day, but he didn't. It's like something else contributing to the sense of speed, which I, I really respect. It's, it's a really fantastic game. Uh, this is a game called Hockey by Cryptic C. Uh, this is a first person hockey game. So like your mouse kind of controls the way you like orient your hockey stick, which is really cool because you have to like swipe your mouse to like swipe your hockey stick. And you kind of glide around on this ice rink. So it's like the physics and the sense of embodiment. It's a first person shooter. That person is has ice skates and he's a hockey player instead of a first person that's walking around and running and so on. So this is kind of 
totally different concept of like player movement, player physics, which I really like in Fountain Innovation. Uh, there's a game called Valentino Hopes. This one's kind of about gliding through this really gorgeous um, flat shaded kind of vector like space. And this one's kind of about the sense of movement and how we move through space. And uh, again, I can just only recommend it. It's hard to describe in words. Um, but those games are kind of about sense of embodiment. I think another category is maybe another trend that indies are kind of interested in is kind of playing with how first person games abstract the idea of vision in the camera. Um, this is a game called Mirror Moon. Um, it was at the IGF Experimental Workshop, and it was amazing. Um, it's kind of like you're on two different moons, but like they're the same moon, and it kind of plays with your sense of space and senses, and it's really amazing. And a lot of these games are free, so you don't have an excuse. <laughs> um, I can't find the process. <laughs> is this like two minute game on Congregate, but it's amazing. Um, this one, you kind of have direct control over how your eyes focus. So there's kind of this blur filter, and you kind of have to like squint at your computer screen. You're like, oh, is it like focus? Oh, I can't find my glasses. And it's pretty amazing. And there's kind of this like special surprise at the end. It's, um, there's kind of this, it's physically simulated. So you're kind of looking around your glasses in this blurry room, and you're like flipping tables and beds and stuff. <laughs> And when you do find your glasses, you're standing there like, oh my god, I like totally destroyed my room in this quest for glasses. <laughs> and I thought that was like a really neat way of kind of kind of bring like the eyesight, the idea of like eyesight and focusing into the first person genre. Uh, this is a really fantastic game called A Man by Boy Industria. And it's kind of a quote commentary on the military industrial complex and drums and stuff. And the really innovative thing about it is it's it has kind of they kind of this two different pain approach where you could be playing it's like two different games but like you kind of have to focus your maps can only be in one pane so it's kind of like oh should I talk to my blue haired friend and click on a dialogue choice there or should I be shooting terrorists there it kind of plays with how you're splitting terrorists with you're splitting your attention and your gaze which is really fascinating uh, this is a recent game um, from some digital kind of students called Perspective. Uh, this one's a first-person game and a 2D platformer. Um, the way you orient yourself in the space um, forms like the 2D space for the for the little kind of Mega Man-esque character to walk around. So, what seems like a flat like panel that's kind of distorting you to perspective is actually like a sloping floor for this platformer. Mode. And I think that's a really neat way of playing with perspective and so on. Um, but now I kind of want to talk about a different sense of perspective. Perspective in the sense of like understanding, so to speak, like the human condition and all that. Um, this is a game called by Steven Lovell called Cities of Day and Night. And this one's just amazing. Um, I don't want to spoil it for you. Um, but I'll talk about one story that hopefully won't spoil it. Um, there's, this, there's this puzzle that kind of requires you to like circle straight, except the way like the space and the puzzles are configured, it's like, I forgot how to circle straight. And it was, it was kind of like, you know, like the keyboard and mouse, normally when I'm playing these first person shooters, it's like a, it's like a direct connection. These tools, the interface is like ready at hand, and it's just really, I don't even think about what I'm doing. But then this game kind of defamiliarized the computer, de defamiliarized the first person interface to me, and I just found that really fascinating. And this is a really, really hard game, but it's really rewarding. Um, this is a game called Trauma, and this one's kind of a mist for like a modern age. Um, you kind of navigate through these stills, photographic stills, but, and you like click on spaces to navigate it, but, like the way it kind of abstracts it is just really fascinating and you kind of get a sense that 
maybe we all first person games should be like stills or something. Because the way it abstracts space, it can do all these neat tricks with space and how you the mental map of the level as you progress. And that's not possible in like a continuous first person shooter. Um, there's a game called Trip. It's just like a crazy, batshit insane Perry <laughs> simulator, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and you just walk around and like, every, like bulges are bulging where there shouldn't be bulges. And it's just like the entire world is like alive and it's really freaky and you should totally try it. And this kind of understanding is a lack of understanding. Like maybe, but maybe a lack of understanding is good. Maybe like, reason kind of limits us as individuals. Uh, this is another game called Cairo. Um, this is kind of about, this is like a puzzle game about systems and how systems interlock to, um, and like function, and you kind of bring the city to life, bring the city of Cairo to life, and that's really fascinating. Um, Proteus by King Big Kinega. Um, this one's about soundscapes, you know, like everything, Every asset on this procedurally generated island like, generates a sound. So as you walk, you're making your own soundtrack that's kind of unique to your exploration of the space. Um, Frack OSC is an upcoming game where you explore this really amazing neon, like, Tron kind of world. And the puzzles involve learning how to use a MIDI sequencer. So it kind of teaches you how to be like Daft Punk. Like, if you open a door, you have to like make your own kind of like Daft Punk, cool like riff. And it's, it looks really promising. Um, that one isn't enough, yeah. Um, Dirac is about kind of digital mediation, and it's kind of how we, like survival in like a digital context. I don't really know what it is yet. It's really, I tried it, and I was just kind of, my mind was kind of blown. Uh, and memories of broken dimension. Um, this one's just, I don't even know of any other game that looks like this. And this one's about, you can like fragment the world at will, kind of. This one's just something to watch out for. It's not out yet either. But you should totally follow it. So, um, I'm kind of copying Naomi's um, <laughs> pog format here. Um, <laughs> this is the Steve Gaynor pog. Uh, he's a Bioshock designer. And uh, recently in this Eurogamer article, he said, there's sort of this zeitgeist of people saying first person, person perspective is really interesting. What happens if you take out shooting? And that's dated like one month ago. But as I've hopefully proven, we've kind of been thinking about this for a really, really long time. The first mod, or one of the first mods, and one of the first levels doesn't have any shooting. This has kind of been a train of thought. We've been following for a long time. Um, not to take a shit on Steve Gaynor, <laughs> um, but really, we've been here for a long time. Where have you been? <laughs> so that's kind of the end of the quite the indie scene. Um, I guess that's the future history I'm proposing. Yes, in this narrative. Um, so some takeaways here. Um, the Revenge of Mist. Concept. You're on an island and you're solving puzzles in a first person perspective. Um, then there's The Witness by Jonathan Blow coming in 2013. You're on an island in a first person perspective solving puzzles. Um, of course, I'm kind of being disingenuous here, but. You get to read his diary. <laughs> oh my god, his diary. Um, <laughs> Full circle. We kind of ignored Mist and Mist kind of followed out of discourse, but now we're kind of rediscovering it, maybe. Um, another takeaway um, the mod scene was a proto indie scene, right? My, fragmented by NG t engine, I can't talk, tech fundamentalism. Um, it's like, no, Half Life, no, Quake, no, Unreal. And that's all kind of pointless. That doesn't exist in the indie scene at all. It's like, use Flash Punk, that's cool. Use Unity, okay, whatever. And I think that's kind of what stopped the mod scene from like uniting and kind of maintaining this critical mass since they were all fragmented and we don't maintain this critical mass and that's why I bought them flatlined in that graph. Um, another possible takeaway to take away from this. Um, the mod, remember, 
people are still modding, but it's just our old sense of what a mod is has died. Um, because engine licensing was a distribution change. Um, because we could license Unity and UDK and CryEngine at little to no cost to us. And they were really good. And they allowed us to sell our things, too. Um, another takeaway. The indie FPS scene is huge and advanced. And we've been here for a while. And we're exploring discourse in these really sophisticated ways. It's not, it's not four different games interested in SWAT tactics. It's four different games interested in human comprehension and architecture. And I think that's really, that's really interesting. And the takeaway, I hope if there's one takeaway you take away from this, um, it's that amateur game developers have been deeply involved in the first person genre since it first began. The mods have been there since the first person genre emerged as an institution. We've been there from like the first year and we'll be there in like the last year. It's just, we've always been there. And I kind of want to reclaim the first person genre for the people, I guess. <laughs> So don't drink the game industry Kool-Aid. No game industry Kool-Aid. Although I like Kool-Aid. <laughs> um, so some kind of notes for, I guess, the game developer history, so to speak. Because I think scholars do need to kind of start looking at this because the digital traces are getting erased as we speak. Servers shut down. Even archive.org was really incomplete for the little data that I wanted. And I think scholars should start looking at this and kind of start recording this for prosperity or whatever. Um, whatever, posterity. Um, and in considering this game over history, you need to consider the tech, the engine tech, and how games are actually constructed, the engineering of it. Um, you also need to consider the distribution model. I also want to kind of push this idea of understanding game developers as like clusters and geographical locations, you know? Was the New York City school of game design thing yeah, in comparison to the Vancouver or Montreal school and so on? You know, who will write our Wikipedia page? Right now, if you go to the first person Wikipedia page, it's again, it's just company history. It's not people history. And that's